Okay, okay. Welcome everybody. Um, this is our transition chat for May, and we're really lucky. Um, we're, our topic is guardianship and legal concerns for our children with disabilities as they transition from school into adult life. So today we have Victoria Sularezki, mm -hmm. I hope I said it correctly, from Bowie Jensen. Um, she will present um, her information. You can put questions in the chat box and I will make sure that we address them. And then if there's time at the end of the presentation before six o'clock, um, if you wanna unmute and ask her your questions um, that haven't been addressed, please do it then. All right, I'm gonna mute myself and Thank hand it over to Victoria. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen so the PowerPoint presentation comes up, and then we'll get started. Okay. So, as Anne said, um, Victoria Sellers-Ziski, I'm an attorney with Bowie and Jensen. Um, I am an attorney that does special needs planning, um, state planning, regular state planning, guardianship work. Um, and special needs planning and um, also um, some estate administration. So first I wanna thank Ann for having me here tonight. We're gonna to talk about guardianships and alternatives to guardianships. And um, first, um, yes, the dreaded legal disclaimer. Um, this presentation is not legal advice. Um, it does not um, initiate an attorney client um, type of relationship. Um, but um, it does uh, give you, uh, hopefully, a tremendous amount of information that you can um, come back and take a look at and replay the recording and get some um, more um, clarity on some options as far as guardianships and alternatives to guardianships. Um, this little, wonderful little girl is my daughter, um, Abigail. Um, she is, will be 25 on Wednesday, May 1st. And she transitioned um, back in 2020 from the Maryland School for the Blind. Um, and she is multi-disabled and medically fragile. So um, I've been through transition myself. Um, I know how it feels um, and kind of what you're worrying about and what um, um, you know, supports are out there for you guys. Um, so let's get started. So at 18 years of age, that's the age of majority in Maryland. And at 18, um, each individual has the legal capacity to make their own decisions. And that's going to be legal decisions, it's going to be healthcare decisions, it's going to be financial decisions, and everyday life decisions. That's the age of majority, that's the presumption. We are concerned at age of majority at things during healthcare regarding HIPAA, which is our federal privacy law healthcare privacy law, and then also FERPA, which is a education privacy law, which really comes into play if your um, student is duly enrolled in a community college class and a secondary school class, that FERPA law will attach to their ability to make decisions on the community college side of things. So I always want to point that out um, for FERPA. What is capacity? So we talked about at 18, you become a legal adult, you're able to make decisions for yourself. And everyone is deemed to have capacity until they are deemed not to have capacity. And capacity really means that it's, you know, each individual is able to understand and communicate what their choices are. Um, and any alternatives um, to, to those choices and to be able to understand the consequences of their choices. There is, like I said, a legal and a societal um, presumption of competency in adulthood until that competency or that presumption is rebutted. A physician certificate is really helpful in capacity as far as you know making sure that your child has capacity if he or she does have capacity or you think they have capacity having a doctor's certificate um, in um, a file would be really helpful to a individual who is perhaps creating estate planning documents for your child so I really want to make sure we understand when we're talking about capacity that it's really a continuum 
you have those that are more capable with capacity and you have those that are less capable but it's not an e you know it's not a one size fits all it's not a yes you're less capable or you're only more capable there is a continuum here that people are on um, and each individual is different as far as their capacity in this continuum so if the individual is capable of making a voluntary, independent, and informed decision, then they're going to be on the most cap uh, capable end of the capacity. If it is the reverse, where they're not capable of making decisions for themselves, then they're going to be on the lesser side of the continuum for capacity. So when we're talking about healthcare decision making with capacity, we're really talking about are they able to understand the fruits of their labors, of their bounty, the bounty of their desires? What does that really mean? It really means are they able to consent or to withhold consent for any type of medical care? Are they able to employ and discharge healthcare providers? Can they make, can they transfer, can they discharge decisions from healthcare providers? Are they gonna understand if a doctor orders a CAT scan, what does that mean? Or do they simply don't realize that they are sick and that they need to go to the doctors? It's also consent to the provision or the withholding or the withdrawing of healthcare and life-sustaining procedures. So that's healthcare decision-making with capacity. The least alternative and the least restrictive in healthcare decision making is legal documents, such as an advanced directive. An advanced directive is a legal document that appoints an agent to act when you are not able to make informed decisions. It may be very specific in instructions about the care that you want to receive. It also engages the individual in an important act as an adult, and that's really planning for their own future and making meaningful appointments through their advanced directive. It can be flexible, it can be changed, it's not set in stone. You can make an advanced directive, for instance, and name your mom as your primary agent, but then later change and want your father to be one or some other individual, then that new directive becomes the directive that would rule. It can be effective when you sign it. It can be effective upon two doctors certifying that you're incapable of making decisions for yourself for your health care. So this is a legal document that's going to require capacity in order to sign it. What happens when you don't have the legal capacity to sign an advanced directive? That's when we're going to go down the continuum that I talked about from lesser restrictive to most restrictive. So with that continuum, the first lesser restrictive is your advanced directives, your healthcare power of attorneys, your most orders, and then also goes next step to your surrogate decision making, then supported decision making, and then guardianship. So you're going from least restrictive to most restrictive. What's surrogate decision making? Surrogate decision making under Maryland law allows certain people to make healthcare decisions for a person who is not capable of making an informed decision and who has not appointed a healthcare agent or an agent is not available. So instance, if you have the capacity for an advanced directive and you can sign an advanced directive, then that's the avenue that you should be taking because it's less restrictive. If that is not possible because capacity does not exist or capacity existed and then capacity now does not exist, then we're talking at the alternatives, which would be surrogate decision making or supported decision making or guardianship. The first of those three other options to advance directive, which is on the lesser alternative um, down the continuum of capacity, is going to be your surrogate decision making. 
So in Maryland, there's a priority order of who can serve as a surrogate for someone else. First, it's a guardian, if the guardian, um, if the patient has one. Um, the patient's spouse or domestic partner, which typically in transition use is not present. Um, an adult child of the patient, a parent of the patient, an adult brother or sister of the patient, or a friend or relative who meets certain requirements um, under the law that we'll uh, discuss shortly. So if it's a friend or other relative making a decision other than your parent or your brother or your sister who are adults, then that friend or that other individual has to be a competent individual. They have to be over the age of 18 and they have to present an affidavit to a physician stating that the relationship is a friend or a relative that is not a brother or a sister or a parent and that you can demonstrate through this affidavit that you understand the health care desires and health care decisions that the individual that you are acting as a surrogate for has made that you know, known to you, whether it's speaking to you and telling you what that person wants um, or having the enough knowledge to understand that these are the desires for the health care that um, the individual you are acting on behalf as a surrogate would like to um, have for their health care. Again, this becomes a little bit um, more difficult if the individual that you're acting as a surrogate has never had the capacity from day one um, to share those and express those wishes to you as a surrogate. The next continuum is supported decision making. The supported decision making is um, allowing an individual to communicate, make known, effectuate decisions using someone who's trusted to them um, to make those decisions on their behalf. It's person centered, which means that the supported decision maker is not just like surrogate decision making is not substituting their own wishes and their own beliefs of what the healthcare decision should be for the individual they're acting on behalf. It has to be based on that individual's desires, wishes, and wants. The person with the disability is the decision maker. The supporters help, but they cannot decide and they cannot substitute their own beliefs into that surrogate or supported decision making. It's really designed to give validity to the decisions that the disabled individual has made and make sure that their desires and their wants are um, actually made in that context. So consent, you could go to the doctors with your individual, your adult child who has a disability and if they can consent to you being in the room or have them consent for the doctor to speak to them, that's an alternative to guardianship. Many doctors will want some type of documentation. You know, you're not going to run into a consent issue at your pediatrician's office. There's a long history there. Really, it, it really goes to the decision making of the surrogate and the, and the um, individual under the advanced directive that someone who's not typically in your healthcare um, decision making and, and healthcare decision as a provider, where we don't, that's where we sometimes see issues with these alternatives to guardianship um, if it's not in an advanced directive. But consent is definitely an alternative. It is a lesser um, alternative to healthcare decision making than um, a guardianship. Um, it is really to make sure that um, the healthcare provider understands um, that your child has given consent for you to be in the room. Um, I know when my daughter was turning 18, we were at a doctor's appointment. We were six months from um, turning 18. The risk management department started putting the wall up saying, no, we need to have 
Abigail's consent, um, not yours, mom. Um, and we went around and around a little bit. And finally, I said, fine, you know, my daughter's nonverbal, go ahead and explain it to her. And so what they ended up doing was just giving Abigail a piece of paper. And then Abigail turned around and gave it to me. So that was her way of saying nonverbally, I consent that my, my mom be present. Um, although I will argue, I don't think she understood it as an informed consent, but it was some form of her wish here, mom, you've got the paper now. Can we, can we move forward? That was her way of saying that it was okay for them to speak with me just because she knows automatically that mom's going to be there to give her the piece of paper. So the most restrictive is guardianship. So guardianship is a legal process. It's a judicial process. And it's really designed to determine whether or not someone is capable of making certain decisions regarding their health care and also their finances. It requires you to go to court. It's um, adjudicating an individual to be disabled and incapable of making decisions for themselves in the healthcare and in finances, one or both. It's a long-term relationship with the court. It takes away rights of the individual um, and it's a public record, meaning it's public record on what we call Maryland case search, which is our electronic case system here in Maryland. You won't be able to read any of the documents. It's not public in that respect. It's just public that the case does exist and it would say that it was a guardianship proceeding. And it is expensive compared to other uh, options that are less restrictive. So when you do a guardianship, you can do a guardianship of the person, you can do a guardianship of the person and property, or you can do a guardianship of the property. When is guardianship necessary? It's necessary when lesser restrictive alternatives are not available. And it's for individuals over the years of 18, um, as far as healthcare goes, unless there is um, a minor that needs a guardian, and that's a different discussion. What is the process? So first you have to file the guardianship petition in the circuit court where the alleged disabled resides. So if you are a Baltimore County resident, you're going to be filing in Baltimore County. If you are in another jurisdiction in the state, you would be filing it in that jurisdiction. There's a petition for guardianship and there's certificates that we'll talk about that also will be required at the time that you file the guardianship. Then you must serve a show cause order and all copies of the guardianships to particular interested persons that we will discuss further. And then they're going to appoint a court appointed counsel for your disa allegedly disabled individual. There'll be a hearing. Then there's um, a pre-hearing orientation required, a post training required and annual reports. So that's a summary of the guardianship process. And we'll go into more detail regarding that now. As I said, the petition for guardianship is going to be filed in the county that the individual that's allegedly under the disability resides in. The facts must demonstrate that the individual requires a guardian and that there's no lesser restrictive form and alternative to guardianship. The court decides the validity of the guardianship petition and there's certain parties to it. The individual who's asking to be named guardian of the person or guardianship of the property is the petitioner. There are interested persons and they are the alleged disabled, the Baltimore County Department of Social Services, if you're in Baltimore County. And if the individual is receiving benefits from the Social Security Administration, the Social Security Administration has to be served. If the individual is receiving any type of benefits from the Maryland Medical Assistance Program, then Maryland Medical Assistance has to be served care of the Office of the Attorney General. 
and if they're receiving any benefits from DDA, Developmental Disabilities Administration, then they too will be served through the Office of the Attorney General. The other interested persons is any other parent that's not petitioning the court. We frankly would get consent of that parent up front if it's possible. And then any siblings of the alleged disabled individual, including half siblings and adopted siblings. Once the court gets the petition, they are going to appoint a court appointed counsel for the alleged disabled. The alleged disabled counsel's sole responsibility is to make sure that that person requires a guardianship. They're going to come out, they're going to meet your child, they're going to sometimes ask you questions, sometimes the court appointed counsel wants to meet without you in the room. Um, these are investigative type of, um, of visits. And then the court appointed counsel is going to file what's called an answer. And in that answer, it's going to answer, so to speak, the allegations in the petition. And it's either going to be, we agree, we don't agree, we don't have enough information to agree or not agree. Typically, the court appointed counsel will waive the presence of the alleged disabled and will waive a jury trial for your child. Then the show cause order, once everyone can be served and proof that everyone has been served, then it gets set in for a hearing. Okay. Now we talked about certificates. What does that mean? In Maryland, you need two certificates. So when you file your petition for um, guardianship, you're going to be attaching a physician certificate and one of the following, another physician certificate or a psychologist certificate or a psychiatrist certificate or a licensed clinical social worker certificate or a nurse practitioner. One of those and it's typically your physician has to do a physical exam on the alleged disabled individual within 21 days of you filing the guardianship petition. I typically represent, uh, recommend to my parents that you go get the other certificate first. And once you have that other certificate in hand, then go get the physician certificate and the physician exam that way once we get both physician certi both certificates back, then we can go ahead and file the petition for guardianship. And we would be working on that petition for guardianship while you're collecting those certificates. So once we get those back, we're ready to file and we will satisfy the 21 day um, requirement. Once we get the certificates back and we serve everyone, and I want to talk just briefly about serving everyone. The alleged disabled person typically, at least in our office, will be served by a process server. All the other interested persons we could either serve, as a, serve through a process server or we can use certified mail return receipt requested. 99% of the time, that's the way that we serve in our office, other than the alleged disabled. Now, having said that, since COVID, we've been having a lot of difficulties with getting the green cards back on certified mail. We either don't get them back, we get them back and they're not signed, or we get them back and they're coded C-19, but there's a signature, which is code for the U.S. Postal Service individual actually signing the card. Don't panic. We've worked really hard to make sure that we've been able to um, make this seamless as possible. So what we do in those instances is we confirm with the individual we're trying to serve whether or not they received it. If they have, then we ask them, did you get the green card? Yes or no? Yes, I put it back in the mail and I signed it. Whatever the case may be, we do an affidavit and we uh, submit the affidavit along with the service and that's been satisfying the court that we're able to prove that the individual or the agency has been um, successfully, successfully served. 
once they get it all back um, and everyone's been successfully served, the Baltimore County will go ahead and schedule the hearing. There's two types of guardianship hearings. There's a contested one and there's an uncontested one. I typically see with individuals that are transitioning from the school system, they are almost always, you know, uncontested. Usually everybody's on the same page. Um, usually the court appointed counsel has waived jury trial. They waive the individual needing to be present. And um, it's a 15 minute hearing. And in Baltimore County, at least, they are still, the hearings are still during, um, through a Zoom call. Everybody gets on the Zoom call on the morning or the afternoon docket, and the judge calls case after case after case until he's finished his docket. The burden of proof is by clear and convincing evidence. So the more that we plead in our pleading and give more facts and more examples of what your child can and cannot do centered around community involvement, um, their healthcare decisions. Can they bathe themselves? Can they, um, you know, do they need help getting in and out of the shower? Do they need help being reminded that they need to take a shower? Do they need help being dressed? Can they pick out their own clothes? Are they going to pick out appropriate clothes? Do they match? Um, can they brush their hair on their own? Can they brush their teeth? Can they shave on their own? These are all things that we discuss in the, in the petition. What about safety? Can your child you know, go to a mall with um, their friends and be able to be safe? I call it the the, pup, the puppy dog syndrome. If someone pulled up to the curb and, and asked your child, come over and see my puppy dog and get in the car, will they do that? Are they vulnerable to that type of um, bad actor? Do they know what 911 is? Can they call 911 if they're in the house and a fire breaks out? Can they cook for themselves? Um, do they even know how to work a stove or a microwave or an oven? Um, can they go grocery shopping? Um, do they understand healthcare? Do they understand when to go to the doctors? Do they understand when they're sick? Do they understand what the doctor says? Will they understand, yes, I need to go for a test and this is what the test means and these are the pros and cons of doing the test. Um, these are the type of um, decision-making that we go ahead and discuss in the petitions so the judge understands clearly what the child can and cannot do, which speaks to the ability for him to make an informed decision regarding his health care or finances if we're filing for guardianship of the property. Okay. And adjudication of a disability for purposes of appointing a guardian of the person and or property is not the same as the basement for basis for commitment to a mental institution. It's also the appointment of the guardian of the person does not modify any type of civil rights unless the court orders it. What is your guardianship responsibilities if you do file for guardianship and you're appointed as guardianship of the guardian of the person and or property? You'll have online training. This training is 45 minutes roughly. It's a pre-hearing, it's a pre-guardianship um, uh, um, appointment training called an orientation. And then there's a post-appointment uh, training on the website as well. There's um, annual report that's due. If your guardianship of the person, it's about an eight page report. It's going to tell the judge and the court how your child's doing during the, the reporting period. Is the child still in school? If they're not, are they attending a day program? Are they out in the community working? Um, are they out of the community at all? What are they doing during their day? Um, what medications they are on? And they want to know the exact name of the medication, the dose that's being taken, and how many times a day the dose is being taken. Who have you seen doctor-wise through the reporting period? And where are they living? Is there any um, need to change any of that information? And finally, the uh, whether or not the guardianship should be continuing. So it's 
an eight page document just about, like I said, and it's pretty straightforward and it's really information that you're going to know for the most part um, automatically. Um, I do like to say to my parents a tidbit that I've learned is, you know, through the year, through the year, just, you know, go on, make yourself an Excel spreadsheet and then record in that Excel spreadsheet when you guys are going to the doctors who you saw, when you saw them, what specialties. So at the end of the year, you can just hit print and attach that to the guardianship report and it kind of makes your life a little bit easier. Same thing with the medication list. If there's more than one or two um, medicines that your child's on, um, my daughter actually is on 19 different ones. So I have a medication list um, because it becomes quite um, complex um, the more medication that you know your child is on. Um, record keeping is really critical. If you are a guardianship of the property, and, and let me talk a little bit about what guardianship of the property really means. Guardianship of the property is going to be individual if someone your child if your child has any asset in their sole name or jointly held with another individual then a guardianship of the property is required except for the following if your child receives social security benefits you're going to be setting up what's called a representative payee account if that account is a representative payee account where his or her social security benefits are being put it, you know, directly deposited into that account, that is an account that is not subject to guardianship of the property. Another example that would be not subject to the guardianship of the property would be a first party special needs trust or a third party special needs trust or a pooled income trust. These are not under the jurisdiction of the circuit court because there's trustees that are managing the money. So everything else would require a guardianship of the property. You would be acting as a fiduciary, as a guardian of the person, and as a fiduciary as a guardian of the property. You're an officer of the court, and your role is to make sure that the individual that you are a guardian for, you are acting in a manner that is, you know, duty to loyalty, duty to make sure that the fiduciary estate's accounted for, a duty to make sure that your ward is being taken care of. Those are the type of fiduciary duties of a guardian. Okay. Some practical tips. Plan early for your child turns 18. Get updated assessments if they're needed, and um, also review, prepare your own estate planning documents to make sure that if your child is going to be receiving a government means tested benefit, such as SSI and or Medicaid, that they don't have more than $2,000 to their name. If you have a 529 plan that was open for your child when your child was born and has been funded and you have other children and your child's not going to go to college and your child is disabled and your child is going to be probably receiving SSI and or uh, Medicaid or Section 8 housing or food stamps, you want to move that 529 plan over to another child or you can convert it now to a Roth IRA. You'd have to cash it out and then put it, depending on how much it is, either in a first party special needs trust or a first party pooled income trust, or if it's under $18,000, you can put it into an ABLE account. Develop a functional system to maintain records. That example of the Excel spreadsheet is one example of a functional system. So at the end of the year, I know all I have to do is bring up my Excel spreadsheet. Um, I will be able to get through the report very quickly. If you are a um, representative payee for the Social Security Administration, you're going to have to be able to account for all the money that he, your daughter or your son receives under SSI each year, particularly if your child lives outside of her, your home. Right now, if they live with you, you're not going to have to report annually, but they can always ask at any given time for a report. 
If your child, like my daughter, lives around the corner from us in their own home with a roommate, then I have to account for every penny of her Social Security or SSI each year. And that's where my record keeping and my Excel spreadsheet really comes in handy. It really makes that task very easy at the end of the year. Identify and utilize your resources. Your transition coordinators in the school systems are fabulous. Use them as your resource. They have lots of information that they can share. They can actually give you all sorts of helpful hints and people to go talk to, different organizations to go talk to. Transition's hard. It's scary. It's just going into an unknown. And as a parent of a special needs child who's been through it, I know how stressful it can really be. So use your resources. No question is, is you know, stupid. It's really just having comfort going out and getting the resources so you can make an informed decision for your child and also for your family. And if you do have any questions regarding um, your estate plan, address those early. Make sure that when you um, get your estate planning documents updated that your estate planner understands that you have a child with disabilities and that that child will either be on a means-tested government benefit or most likely will qualify for one in the future. It's really important to have the right documents when you're doing your estate planning so you don't inadvertently um, disqualify your child from a government means-tested benefit. And that would also include grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, cousins, nieces, nephews who might want to leave your disabled child with um, some money. That same type of uh, planning is very important for their documents. If for some reason it turns out that your child does get an inheritance that was not placed in a special needs trust, please do not panic. It's fixable. Um, just reach out to an individual who does special needs planning and they'll be able to help you um, get those um, that inheritance into the right vehicle that is legally um, exempt for means tested benefits um, for your child. So I've gone through a lot tonight. Um, any questions? Hi, this is Ann. I'm going to go through the questions in the chat box first and um some of them I, I put in there and some of them somebody else did, but um, I'll go through them. And then if anybody else has other questions, I will just encourage you either to use the chat box or if you're comfortable unmuting yourself, um, just asking, you know, write it right here. Um, so my first question was, is it likely that SSA or medical assistance or DDA will attend a hearing if they're served? Great question, Anne. So they are required by Maryland law to be served. I've been doing this for north of 15 years, and I've only had Social Security once, which was literally last four months ago. Contact me regarding um, my um, petitioner, um, and it had absolutely nothing to do with the guardianship. They were trying to locate them and, and get a good address for another Social Security issue. So I have not heard from Social Security. Now, the Department of Social Services, um, they sometimes will file an answer, um, which um, I those, that experience has always been, we don't have anything that we are, disagree with. Um, the Department of Social Services in Baltimore County actually is really terrific. Um, they do a lot of public guardianships, unfortunately, but they are really wonderful with the um, the um, special needs planning bar, um, and we have a really great relationship with them. Um, medical assistance, no, I haven't had anybody um, come in or from DDA whatsoever. Okay, I didn't think so, um, but I wanted to check and see if that was a likely thing. Um, and then the next thing I wrote in the chat box was not a question, but I just a statement, and I think I'm correct in this, that our school system in Baltimore County doesn't allow their staff to um, to make certificates um, for guardianship hearings. I don't know if that's true across the board in school systems or in private schools, but um, so you can't go to your school social worker and ask them to do that. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up, Anne, because the LCSW is typically outside of the school system. It's a different type of certificate, I believe. Um, school psychologists, um, 
they're they're not typically are not giving the um, the actual certificate. Um, usually, it's an outside um, school psychologist and psychiatrist. Um, same thing. Um, so it's really we see a lot of certificates from Kennedy Krieger. See a lot of certificates from private um, psychiatrists and psychologists. And then, of course, pediatricians, if you're lucky at the age of 18, 21, to still be seeing your pediatrician. Um, so I think that's a great um, point to, to point out. So thank you for that. Would they charge for that? Um, it really yes. depends on the, um, the provider. I think if most doctors are doing the exam well, because it's usually, a, you know, you're going to a doctor visit and they're doing an exam. Kennedy Krieger, um, typically I see the behavior um, the um, neuropsychologist um, filling out forms, um, usually at the end of a visit, or mm -hmm. I've had them where they've ha already had a visit, and then three months later, they need a certificate, and they're, they're fine, and they just go ahead and fill it out. So it really depends on the provider. I've seen it several ways. Thanks. And how long does the process generally take if it's uncontested? Um, so in Baltimore mm -hmm. County, if every the key is getting everybody served. Yeah. If, Let's say that we get everybody served through those through the green cards and um, we get them done on the first try. Then um, it's really usually takes about two to three months to get a hearing. Um, if we have trouble with the green cards, it could be as long. I mean, I've had unfortunately one that was an entire year. Now, having said that, that was in 2020 when we were in the throes of COVID. It was extremely difficult because nobody was in the offices. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been typically running around two to four months, you know, given um, the first try on um, the certificates. Okay, thank you. Um, are ABLE accounts subject to guardianship of property? I think you did address that. No, they're not. Okay. No. So that belongs to the individual. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if a residential agency becomes the SSI payee, does that agency do the reporting or is that still up to the guardian, appointed guardian? No, the representative payee, if it's an agency, a DDA agency, the DDA agency is making the report to Social Security Administration and a guardianship of the property is still not required. And approximately what should a people expect to be paying for um, going through the guardianship process? Great question. Again, it, it ties to, um, at least in my practice, the having to reserve and reserve. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting it right now. It's anywhere, frankly, between $2,500 up to like $4,500, depending on how quickly we can get everybody served. And I know that sounds, um, you know, it's the, the process of getting everybody served is just time consuming. And what happens is if you don't get service, then you have to petition the court for a new show cause order to be issued and then you serve again if you still can't get it then you have to file for a motion for alternative service and prove that you've tried several times in different ways um, and attach your proof and then another request for a show cause um, is order to be issued so by having all that having to happen you're you're drafting new petitions, you're drafting petitions that you're not normally doing in order to get somebody served. So we try in our office to be very quick in getting everybody served. We try everything we possibly can. If we're still within the period and we know that the person hasn't returned a green card, we will often reserve them again by certified mail return receipt because we're still less costly than having to go through those other avenues. So um, we keep on our green cards to make sure where we know they are through tracking of the U.S. Postal Service in order for us to make sure that we're doing what we can not to have to go those other options. So are there options for people who really can't pay that? There, there is legal aid, um, Baltimore County um, Legal Aid, um, the Maryland uh, Volunteer Lawyer Service, MVLS, is another wonderful um, group that could potentially help you depending on, um, I think that there's um, some um, type of um, income based um, criteria there. Um, that Those are the two that come to mind. Pro Bono Resource um, Center is another, another way. 
Okay. And who pays for the court appointed attorney for the alleged disabled person? Another great question. It depends. I know that's a lawyer answer, but it really does depend. If the court appoints a lawyer that is on contract with the county to serve as a court appointed counsel, then the cost to the petitioner is nothing. If by if, however, it is a lawyer that is not on contract, then that lawyer has to file a fee petition to get paid. And that fee petition is really limited to, I believe it's $200 an hour in comparison to whatever their um, billable hourly rate is. So there is a cap. Um, it just really, I, I, I hate to say it depends, but it does. Yeah, but um, that, in that case, that would be the petitioner who would pay that? That's correct, because typically individuals that are transitioning, they don't have any money. So it would be the individual that's paying for the guardianship. My own daughter's guardianship, I did not get a contract lawyer in the Anaroma County. So I had to pay the um, court appointed counsel. Okay. And, and their rates vary. It just, like I said, it depends on how many hours it takes for them to come out, visit. Um, they go to court as well. They're, they're within the hearing. Baltimore County, it's a little bit easier because of Zoom. Yeah, um, it's not an in-person. So I think that cuts down on some costs. You know, you don't have the cost of travel. You don't have the cost of, um, you know, those type of costs that typically you know, occur when, when a lawyer goes to court. Great. Um, those are the questions in the chat box. I want to give everyone an opportunity if you had something to ask or a comment. Um, to go ahead and make that now. I just thought of another question though. So I'll give I'll 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 be quiet for a minute and see if anybody else wants to talk. Not yet. Okay. My other question I just thought about is um when you say that guardianship takes away a person's rights, that doesn't mean all rights. It, That's correct. Right. So yeah. can a person who who's under guardianship get married, make that yeah. choice to get married? They, get, they can get married, um, they can still vote. Um, the one thing that a guardian cannot do is two things. One, they cannot um, voluntarily commit their ward into a mental institution and they cannot sterilize mm -hmm. a, a ward. Okay. Typically when a parent is being um, appointed guardian of the person, we ask for what's called, we, uh, us lawyers call it option B. And that's really allowing the individual to make any type of decisions regarding healthcare, including end of life decision making. Um, they are in the, under Maryland law, they are part of the individuals that can do that. Um, I never had a judge say no, particularly if it's a parent or a sibling, you know, a, 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 a close family member. I even have had um, cousins and nieces be able to make those decisions. The one thing that you have to do is if you change the classification of the abode, that you have to inform the court. So for instance, when our daughter moved out of our house around the corner to her own little place with her roommate, um, and her nurses and her aides, we had to petition the court for Anne Arundel County requesting that that be okay. I got an order back right away. Um, it's really a notification um, and to let the court know that that has happened. So in that instance, we went from family home to another family home, mm -hmm. but a different type, more of a, uh, a roommate type of situation. So that would be a classification of of change of abode. And a person under guardianship can apply for Section 8 housing or whatever yes. we're calling it nowadays. Okay. Yes. Emily has her hand up. Yeah. Hi, thank you for um, all your information and your time for this evening. Um, what about when um, we have some providers that do, um, I guess, some kind of uh, formal letter that's notarized to make medical decisions? How does that work? Does that, is that able to take the place of any of this? 
So I'm not following exactly what you're saying as far as a medical provider. You're I think you mean a, a medical surrogacy. Is that what you mean? Emily? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you go ahead. So if, if you have a surrogate decision maker under Maryland law, they can, if they are in that group of individuals, um, guardian first, then um, a parent, um, a sibling, those type of individuals, under Maryland law, they are supposed to be able to make a surrogate decision making for the individual who's disabled, whether or not they've ever had capacity or not. The reality of the situation, I would say eight out of 10 times is that you get what I call the risk management buzzsaw, where the risk management department of the the medical place that you're trying to get the medical help from says, we're not going to allow you to um, make a decision for this individual unless you produce an advanced directive or a court order appointing you guardian of the person. Um, that's, I have clients that come to me and say, my child is 19 and I can't seem to get an appointment or I can't talk to my own insurance company about my son because he's 18 and they're saying they want an advanced directive or a guardianship order. I have some clients who are coming to me and their child is turning 56 or 57 and they haven't had any problems until now. What do they do? Maryland law says that the surrogate decision maker can make those decisions. I'm just explaining how experience and through what's happening with some of my clients and frankly, my own experience when my daughter was turning 18, those risk management part departments are out there. And the time that you need that health care is really scary if you think you're going to hit, you know, a, a absolute wall. Um, same thing with supported decision making. You're supposed to be able to provide an affidavit that you know what's best for the um, for your child. Um, again, same type of wall sometimes. Um, so, yes, this is definitely Maryland law, and yes, these are the alternatives to guardianships, and these are what the, the decisions and the avenues that we're supposed to be able to take as parents of individuals with disabilities. And I often speak about what the law is, but I also like to also speak to what my clients are getting as far as experience goes, whether it's right or wrong. It's still an experience um, that unfortunately some people are, are experiencing and others don't. So advanced directive, you still have to go through an attorney, correct? A, if you have a child with a disability, I would urge you to go through an attorney because I know in our practice and many of our colleagues um, around Maryland will ask for one certificate of a doctor certifying that that individual is got the capacity to make an informed consent about their health care. Typically, it's a pediatrician. It could be a regular doctor. It could be another medical doctor. And I, I will not draft an advanced directive for an individual who has a disability that I'm, you know, concerned that there's not enough capacity to understand that document unless a doctor signs off on it because I'm not a doctor. Um, there, are, yeah, it's very clear. My daughter, for example, absolutely has no capacity. You know, she's 25 and developmentally 18 months. Yeah, that's a clear case, right? Um, but there's a lot of wonderful individuals who are high functioning and, you know, that's a little bit harder and you want to make sure that you're doing the least restrictive um, for their sake and for everyone else's sake. Um, so I routinely, and like I said, a lot of my colleagues around the state, we will routinely when um, it's not as clear as my daughter um, that, you know, we would go ahead and ask for a, a physician to sign off on their capacity to make that legal document. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? We're just bumping up against our time. Does anybody have um, another question? 
then I think Victoria, we're going to let you go at three minutes early. So thank well, you thank so you. much. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I hope you guys learned a little bit about the different alternatives to guardianship and, and guardianship itself. Um, you know, there's lots, there's some kids who the only alternative, unfortunately, is guardianship. Um, so um, to make sure, and really the, 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 I tell my parents this really quickly too, that this is from guardianship is from 18 to whenever. So you have individuals, th these rules and regulations and the law is in place for individuals turning 18 to those that are 99 to 102, 103 years of age. And um, elder law in the state, there's a lot of abuse of elder law. So I tell my parents, because it is frustrating as a parent, what happened? The clock turned, right? It's frustrating as parents, but it's a little more understanding when it's adult guardianship, which is 18 up. And it kind of makes sense if it's the same process as those that are on the other end of the spectrum where they might be getting abused, um, unfortunately, um, with elder law abuse. Well, thank you so much for all of your, all of your knowledge. I'm going to stop recording now, everybody. Um, so thank you, Victoria. This was a really great session. Thanks for having me.